Advocate and enlighten using communication in politics, policy, and law. Our panelists will share their experiences, insights, and tactics for leveraging communication to inform, engage, and empower diverse audiences in the dynamic realms of politics, policy, and law. Discover firsthand how effective communication can serve as a beacon of enlightenment for our citizenry and as a powerful advocate for specific populations. Moderating this session is Michelle Gailey. With over 30 years of experience in professional communication and 10 years in student success, Michelle focuses on pursuing projects and scholarly activities that advance the field of strategic communication and provide hands-on experiences for students. After serving in both the public and private sectors as a marketing and communication professional, Michelle focused on developing student skills as a tenured instructor and division chair for North Idaho College's College Skills Division. From there, she moved to Eastern Washington University, where she served as the director of the program leading to university success. Plus, in that role, she ensured students from all backgrounds and levels received the support they needed to achieve their goals for both academic and professional success. She joined the Murrow College as an assistant professor, professor of practice in 2022. She teaches courses in public relations and is heavily involved in the Spokane PRSA. Please welcome Michelle. Thanks. That was a nice intro, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here today to moderate this panel with our great panelists today. So um, like the intro said, we're here for Advocate and Enlighten, using communication in politics, policy, and law. So a really interesting topic, and I'm excited to be here and learn more from our panelists. I'd like to introduce them all, so let me read a quick bio for each of them, okay? I know it's kind of weird when people, you know, do your bio and you're sitting there, but you can do it. Okay, all right, so first <laughs> First of all, I'm going to introduce Laura Guido. She is the Borough, Boise Borough Chief and State Government and Politics Reporter for the Idaho Press. She was previously the newspaper's city editor. Before the Idaho Press, she was a reporter at the Whidbey News Times on Whidbey Island in Washington and the managing editor at the Woodenville Weekly. She has a degree in multimedia journalism from WSU, woohoo, and is a lifelong Coug fan. But when she isn't working, she loves to be on the mountains, on the river, and with her cat. I get it, I like to be with my dog on the weekends. Okay, so working on behalf of Washington State's 27 community health centers, Alyssa Patrick collaboratively develops and ex executes policy, advocacy, and PR strategies to expand awareness and access to comprehensive primary care. Alyssa graduated from WSU with a degree in communication in 2013, and she received her MPA from the University of Washington. Throughout her career, she's been a storyteller, a program manager, and a policy analyst in higher ed and different levels of government. So we're really excited to have you here as well. Julie Popper, she mobilizes communication tools to create social change, and for more than 20 years, she's crafted internal and external messaging, built media relationships, and driven social media and digital strategy to assist workers in forming unions, bargaining contracts, and winning in legislative and political arenas. She also serves as a communications strategist for a Washington Education Association. She holds a Master of Arts in Strategic Comm, also from WSU. And then we have Tiffany, Tiffany Sanders. She is the Corporate Affairs Manager for the Fred Meyer and QFC divisions of Kroger. She is a spokesperson for over 42,000 grocery associates. Um, and before joining Fred Meyer, she spent 15 years working in television news, which is really interesting as a meteorologist and news reporter. She holds dual degrees from WSU in broadcast journalism and French foreign language and literatures. And she's also our 2024 Merle College Hall of Achievement inductee. So congratulations. <laughs> Like I said, we're really excited to have you guys here today and share your experiences and insights. So what I thought I would do is just start with questions and then um, we'll try and get through as many as we can and then I'm gonna leave like maybe 10 minutes for some Q&A. Sound good? Okay, so we'll start first with, how did you get started in your profession? And we'll start with Laura. Um, I came here actually with no intention of being a journalist, um, but I liked writing and photography, so I joined the journalism program and 
It was actually uh, Professor Shores, who was here earlier, and many of you may know him. He really pushed me to do a, an internship covering actually the Washington State Legislature uh, for a paper in Moses Lake, and then I pretty much couldn't imagine doing anything else. So now I'm covering the Idaho State Legislature. Yes. Yeah. Um, hi, I just have to first acknowledge that I did get my a degree at that other university on the other side of the state, but try, I believe that I am through and through a coup. Um, my entire family went here. I My first job actually uh, post-college was at WSU. So um, how I got to where I am now is I think by being curious and through relationships and taking on opportunities that I didn't even, that I didn't always know I might like at the moment, but to learn something from it. So uh, my very first job was, uh, well, it was, it came from an internship at the College of Engineering and Architecture at comms internship. And I thought that I didn't care at all about engineering and it was going to be very bored at this job, but I wanted a job and it was comms related. And so I was like, sure, I will, I will do that. Um, but there's a lot of storytelling in trying to explain, um, you know, something like microfluidics to someone who, and I, I still can't, I can't explain it today, but there was a period of like several hours in which I could have explained it really well uh, when I wrote a story about it when I was here as an intern. And um, I uh, had also done some graphic design at that time. So I was doing some, I, I took on a little bit more than that internship asked from me initially. I offered a little bit more. And um, then as it was getting to graduation, they asked if I wanted to stay on full time. And I said, Sure, I, I would do that because it sounded great to not um, apply for jobs at, you know, then I could t I could check, take that off my list. Then all my friends left Pullman and I was a little bit like, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, but it, it was, it continued to be a great opportunity. I got connected to the central WSU marketing communications team, met so many great people in Pullman, found out that the WSU had an office in Seattle, um, which I didn't know about, and um, asked to go to an event there that was related to our work, met some people that then I was able to get a job at WSU Office of Economic Development in Seattle and learned about more uh, how public and private sector works together and, and got really interested in policy and decided I wanted to be doing, um, more, like getting a little bit more into the weeds of policy than just on the communication side. And so that's when I decided to get my master's in public administration. Um, I worked for Seattle City Council for a brief time after that, and then um, in the Office of Sustainability and Environment on food policy, and um, really realized through all of that how much my communications degree was important to the, po the policy work that I was doing. Both of them are inter intertwined. Um, and then I ended up a couple of years ago, um, I was interested in working back at the state level. And so now I'm working for the Washington Association for Community Health. Uh, we're a member organization for, for primary care um, association. And I'm doing both policy and comms work together. Um, and it's exciting. Hi, I'm Julie. Um, I came to this work sort of backwards. Um, I did my undergrad degree at the University of Wisconsin at Madison um, in medieval history. Um, I can fluently read handwritten Latin from the 13th century, in case you're looking for someone awesome. with party skills. Um, but Madison is a lot like here in that there is a protest every day. And I got really involved in the student movement against sweatshops, and that's where I learned how to write a press release and a press advisory. That's where I learned how to take media interviews. Um, but of course, the, the Student Center for Jobs doesn't tell you you can be an advocate full time. Um, they probably don't want you to actually, because it's not great for recruiting new students. Um, so I went to grad school at Johns Hopkins in medieval history um, with intention of getting a PhD. And it took about a year for me to realize I was spending more time um, doing activism around the minimum wage on campus than I was actually doing the medieval history work. Um, so that's when I went to work first for the Sierra Club, um, doing uh, organizing and communications around uh, progressive policy. And that was uh, originally in environmental justice. I've worked in um, low income housing. I've worked for LGBTQIA rights. Um, and I came home to the labor movement. Um, I grew up in a labor family, but I came home to the labor movement ooh, 20 years ago. Ooh, um, and now that's what I do is um, media relations communications for the Washington Education Association. We are the statewide teachers and educators union. Wow. Well, my pathway is nowhere near as esteemed as you all are very impressive. <laughs> I was simply a student here and I wanted to work on Dateline. <laughs> you know, but I, was, I loved Dateline growing up. 
So I, I studied at the Murrow School, graduated from here, and then got an internship at a TV station. And I thought that was going to be my path. Um, I, I worked at TV stations for about 20 years, big and small, ended up in Seattle, um, and then woke up one day and realized I was tired. <laughs> I was aging. I was getting older. Um, I was ready for a change. So I, I took a position I uh, thought was going to be a very quiet um, little position with a grocery store. Um, I thought I would ride off into the sunset and finish my career just working quietly as a spokesperson for a grocery store and then the pandemic hit. And right away, my first week on the job, it was advocating for 42,000 associates who are now frontline workers. And I will tell you that it called on all of my skills that I had honed here at Murrow and as well as in the TV business um, of storytelling, right? It was helping to get those associates working in the grocery stores, the things they need to be safe. So it was working with legislators and governors and city council members to get them gloves and masks and plexiglass and um, getting them the, you know, the vaccine and helping to keep them safe. So I really uh, found myself kind of thrust into the advocacy role. It wasn't something that I sought out necessarily. Perfect. Wow, you guys really have impressive backgrounds, all of you. So let's ask the next question here and feel free to you know, answer this one or if you think it doesn't pertain to you, but I think it does to all of you. So let me ask this next one. What role does storytelling play in conveying the impact of policies and legal decisions to different communities? Um, I would say in my field, storytelling kind of, it takes two roles. For one, it's the stories of the people that policies actually affect. Um, it's one thing to kind of think of policy as like a theoretical concept, but it's another to, to meet the people that, that are actually affected by it. Um, an example of this recently is uh, Idaho did a study and found that they had a huge shortage of in-home healthcare workers. And this was a policy issue because it's because they hadn't updated their Medicaid reimbursement rates to actually pay those workers since the 90s or early 2000s. So those people are being paid through Medicaid. They're also on Medicaid because they don't make very much money. Um, and then the other impact of that is I, I met someone who's a quadriplegic. He relies on an in-home healthcare worker to get out of bed in the morning, to scratch his face, to, to do anything. Um, he was a, an extremely impressive person. He painted with his mouth. He was um, really good at it. And uh, I got to tell his story and how the shortage has affected him as well as his healthcare worker and how little she gets paid and how tough it is because there's such a, a shortage. And then the other role of storytelling, I think, is when I cover the legislature, there's telling what happened, but then there's something interesting about how it happened. Um, I think it's everyone's right to know how their lawmaker, their elected officials get along with each other or how they don't. And, you know, if something passes through a committee and it's no big deal, that's one thing. But if they're fighting with each other, if they're arguing, if they're arguing with the public, which happens, I think that that's all worth telling that story as well. Yeah, yeah, really good points. Um, and really, I work in healthcare, obviously, so Medicaid reimbursement rates, and so I was kind of thinking about that. Storytelling is everything about policy work because, um, you know, from from the position that I am sitting in, uh, my the health centers that I represent, they need the work that they do to to work well, and so sometimes that means I have to explain. We have to explain to the legislature why a change needs to happen, um, and this is very wonky, complicated stuff. Um, how, how healthcare providers get paid um, is really complicated for a lot of reasons we could go into in a different panel. But so what we need to be able to communicate to the, to the legislators who only have so much time and not all of them are, but like five of them have any expertise in healthcare. Um, we have to be able to tell the story of, of why the reimbursement rate is not enough and what that means. And, um, and we have to be able to uh, then also tell the story to the public of um, why how why something isn't happening that people need it in their primary care settings. And so um, it really matters to understand your audience um, and not just when you're writing a press release or that sort of thing, but re understanding your audience when you're having a one-on-one -on -one meeting 
uh, with a stakeholder or a legislator? And then what are the key points you're bringing to that person? Um, and what do you know about that person? What matters to them? And how do you connect it to the work that um, you're doing or the folks that you're representing are doing? And um, I think also really getting on the ground experience with with the people that you're serving is really important. And um, I think to some of the other questions as well, um, but you know, I represent health center or my organization represents health centers across the state. I recently went to Okanagan County um, to where family health centers are and drove with the CEO from their, one of their clinics in OMAC to TWISP. And so that, that was an hour long drive. And so then I can speak a little bit better. I don't have the experience of living there, but I can speak a little bit better to like what the transportation issues are in a rural health setting and um, and so uh yeah it's absolutely critical um at every level i think agreed <laughs> i'll also say um i come to these things and i feel weird about some of the things i say because uh sometimes people that work in politics want to keep our toolboxes to ourselves um because you don't know who's in the audience it could be your opposition right but Okay, top secret. Um, so there is a ton of research being done around messaging across the aisle and how we can talk to the public in a way that really brings people along. And the first thing you have to establish before you get people to even listen to you is shared values. And shared values aren't statistics. Um, they come from the heart, not the head. And they come from people talking from the heart about their individual experience in their language that they're used to speaking to looking like they look on the job or in their house or wherever um, they're talking about. Um, and they have to be people who can tell that compelling story that makes people pause and reconsider what their assumptions were. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times we work for organizations, I'll just say I've worked for organizations where they want the president or the CEO to be out there talking and they want really fancy statistics. And I even have like teachers that I'm about to put on the news say, oh, what was the percentage of students who graduated with second languages? Like, no, nobody wants the percentage. Let's talk about that student that you helped learn a language that allowed them to connect with their community. Let's talk about your experience in the classroom from the heart. Everyone knows educators. They live in your community. Tell your story from the heart. Um, and I think, you know, we're in such a, a place of uh, people on TV doing spin. And even our spokespeople that are meant to tell stories want to be that person. They want to be the talking head. And I think as communicators, what we can do is assure them that there is value in their experience. There is value in the language they speak, in the community they come from. Um, and there is value in, in just sharing what they see every day. Um, because folks are really shy to do that because they feel like they're not experts. Yeah, storytelling is, is vital. I think that if you are able to write well, and if you know how to tell a story, you're always going to have a job. I will just tell you, every organization, every company, every group out there, needs quality storytellers because that's how you connect with an audience, right? That's how you feel emotion and you change behaviors or you change minds or you help get people on board. So um, I think Murrow, the Murrow School does such a wonderful job with instilling that in the students. I think at least my experience when I was here, you had to write your tail off, right? You were writing all the time and I will tell you, you will use that no matter what job you're in, whether it's crafting an email, a text, or speaking in front of a camera, you will always use those skills that you're learning right now in these classes. Um, but as you're trying to advocate out with elected officials um, or with unions or with anyone, um, it's so important to be able to tell that story because that's what's gonna connect you. That's what's gonna help them see where you're coming from and where you're gonna hopefully find some common ground. So, you know, I, I can go to the governor of Oregon and explain why I think they need to change a policy because of uh, how it affects our stores and safety. Or I can go to the governor and say, listen, I have a 92 year old bagger who bags groceries in one of our stores. This is why this matters. I think it helps create that connection. And that's so important. Great, thank you. And um, the next question, I think Julie even talked a little bit about this in terms of shared values. And we talk a lot about that in our PR and our marketing um, classes as well. But I'd love to ask you all, we are in an era of heightened skepticism and distrust. 
unfortunately. How do you build and main trust with your different audiences that you work with? I'll jump in first. <laughs> I feel bad that she's having to go first every time. Um, the first thing I will say is that as you go to interview with a company, as you're looking at jobs, do your research, find out what their values are, because you want to make sure that they align with your values. There's nothing worse than working for a company and having to spout stuff that you don't agree with. So do your research. Most companies, most organizations should have a mission statement or a, a, um, you know, a purpose statement. Know that, read it before you go into that interview and make sure that it aligns with your personal values because that really matters. But I think with skepticism, it's a healthy skepticism, right? I think it's healthy to, to challenge and push and question authority. Um, but I think that if you're gonna be on the receiving end of that, you need to make sure that whatever you are saying, whatever you're communicating aligns with the values of the place that you're working and it aligns with your values. And I always tell our store leaders, so we have about 180 stores that I oversee, I tell the store leaders, when you're making tough decisions, hold it up to that, to that list of values that we have. Safety, you know, inclusion, diversity, make sure that the decision you're making aligns with those values. Because if you do that, if something happens, you'll be able to explain why you made the decision you made, right? And you have legs to stand on. I think that's so important. Okay. <laughs> um, I made notes on this one because uh, I think it's so important. And, you know, honestly, I think some of the erosion of trust has to do with um, folks trying to make something untrue look true by manipulating words, by manipulating statistics. Um, and so, it's partially our fault as PR people. Don't be that person. Um, so when I was new in, in comms, I thought it was really fun to kind of like spin words and play with words and turn half truths into truths by adding a maybe in the middle of the sentence. Like that was a really bad idea. I don't do that anymore. Um, but a couple things that I find really important is do what you say you're gonna do. Um, a lot of times we put surveys in the field or we'll send out a postcard that says, we're gonna give this to your lawmaker. The postcards come in and no one has time to collate them by who's in what district. And then the postcards sit there and you don't do what you say you're gonna do. Um, and, and that's just one example. Um, a lot of times when we're communicating with people, we're aspirational. We talk about plans. Um, we talk about things we want to do. Um, and I've gotten very careful not to do that unless we can really follow through and make it happen. Um, cause I think that's important to trust. The other thing is after you do it, tell people, um, we are also in the organizations I work for very good at doing things and then not reporting out that we did it or winning things and then moving on to the next thing and not reporting out that like, Hey, we asked you to do something. Uh, you know, you talk to your lawmaker, you talk to your neighbor, we actually won and here's what we have now. Um, we forget that last part because we're too busy moving on to the next thing. And it erodes trust because people don't see the impact that they have. Um, and then the last thing I wrote down is stand for something. Um, you guys know the rule of thirds, that a third of the world is with you, a third is against you, you speak to the middle third, right? Um, and I think a lot of times as PR people, we're trying to craft messages that make everyone happy. And um, I don't do that anymore because I want to marginalize racists. I don't want homophobes to relate to what I have to say. And if you are in that third that's going to be against me anyways, I really shouldn't bother building a tent that big because I'm betraying my values if I build a tent that big. Um, and I think we are a trust when we build that bigger tent that includes people that disagree with us um, by making our messages less meaningful. Um, so. That's what I mean when I say stand for something. Yeah. Um, yeah, all really good points. Trust, I think there's a lot to say on this topic, but I, um, working in healthcare and then with like government institutions as well, like uh, both of these institutions are untrustworthy to a lot of, and have been historically untrustworthy to a lot of us, almost all of us. And so um, that's, that's a reality to live in too. And um, building trust is about building relationships and taking the time to do that and acknowledging that like maybe someone is going to be, um, it's going to, that's going to be a long road, right? So I know like one, uh, three of our health centers are um, tribal clinics. Um, and um, my organization honestly has a lot of uh, 
trust building that we're doing right now with those three health centers. And uh, because we haven't given the uh, adequate time and understanding to really see um, what their needs are, what the unique needs are of the people that they serve and, and people and indigenous folks that are being served by all of the health centers um, in our system as well. So we're doing some just relationship building and, and, and trust uh, building with our own membership. And so I think that's an important um, part of things as well. And, um, and having vulnerability and acknowledging when we get it wrong too. And um, that's something I work on. We were just talking about like joint, I work on a joint team structure across two different organizations and there's some power dynamics there. And um, that impacts my day-to-day -day job and my ability to help advocate for the health centers that I serve. Um, but I'm trying to be as trans, how can I be transparent in that path? Like that there is a power dynamic and I'm going to, be as honest with you about what I need and why, and you can tell me that you don't like that that doesn't work, but can we have a trusting relationship with each other so then we can work forwards and work forward still in uh, what is a challenging system sometimes. Um, so I work in the media in Idaho, and I wouldn't say that's the world's friendliest environment. To, it, I mean, it's an issue everywhere, but um, it's definitely something I noticed after coming from being a reporter in Washington. Um, but something I found uh, kind of what the other panelists were saying is building those relationships. And I work out of the state capitol, so I'm there every day. Um, there are people who will never answer the phone, but if you're standing in front of their face, you're kind of hard to ignore. <laughs> and and they're off, they often surprise you that the same people who complain about you on Twitter are generally pretty happy to talk to you if you ask them a question in person. Um, and most of them aren't openly hostile. So <laughs> that's something I found. Um, I would say in terms of building trust with our readers, I think seeking out as many different types of voices as you can helps um, coming at things from a place of genuine curiosity. I mean, sometimes you have to ask tough questions and you shouldn't shy away from that. But if you come into it with an obvious chip on your shoulder, you're gonna get defensiveness back and people aren't very uh, willing to share if they're in a defensive place. So I've found that when I've come at people just genuinely curious to hear what their reasonings, what their reasoning is, they're pretty willing to share. And then being really thoughtful with your language. Um, it's easy to use the same terms that people are using to you, but those terms often are really loaded. And it's better just to say the most accurate thing that you can in the most neutral way that you can. And then also obviously just being accurate. People are gonna get mad about what you write about sometimes, but if you ask them to point out anything that's incorrect, if they can't find anything, then that's generally the end of their complaining. So at least <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> um, yeah. I, can I jump in? I think of that's course. such a good point. I think it's so good to remember that when someone disagrees with you, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to, to disagree with someone, right? To have a difference of opinion, that's all right. And I think like you said, Laura, I think that um, Sometimes it's just engaging in conversation without the, without the goal of trying to change their mind, but just to hear them. A lot of times when someone's really upset about something, it's they're not feeling heard. They feel like yeah. no one's listening. They feel marginalized. And so I think that's such a great point that you brought up to engage in conversation and, and listen, right? Don't, don't be quick to, to try to um, change their mind or find a solution, but, but sit down at a table together and break bread and, and talk and, and hear what they have to say because I, I found that diffuses so many situations in life, not only professionally, but personally as well. It's very important. Um, yeah, quickly, I had a story. I used to cover a county commission and one of the commissioners didn't like how much I covered them because I would say when they would fight with each other and things like that, because I thought it was newsworthy and she didn't. But uh, she called me one day and she was upset about a story I was writing and she, she kind of yelled at me for a while and then I said, yeah, I think those were all really valid questions that you had. I'm just trying to ask the same questions you had. And she just immediately was like, all right, well, is there anything that you want to yell about? She just, she <laughs> felt better <laughs> having gotten that off her chest and been responded to. And she was like, all right, <laughs> right. Good to go. Sometimes we just need to be listened to, right? Yes. yes. 
<laughs> um, we have time for a couple of more questions I'm going to ask you all, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So what role do you believe effective communication plays in fostering a more informed and engaged citizenry? I'll just start because I work for a newspaper, so I think <laughs> yeah. uh, you should subscribe to your local paper if you have one, or at least some online news outlet. Um, I think the reason I got into journalism is because I was sitting at the, the Washington State House seeing the kind of insanity that goes on there and how much it affects people, and these are things I had no idea about, and I was like, wow, people should know about this. So, I, I mean, I think it's it's the most important thing that I do is let people know what's going on around them from the people who are in power and how it affects them. So uh, I also think from, again, from a newspaper's perspective, we try and go out into the community, we do forums, we try and live stream them, make them available to as many people as possible. We create voter guides, um, just do everything we can so people know who their elected officials are, what's going on. Yeah, I'll just put an extra plug in for funding public news. TBW also, <laughs> I think we've got a leader from TBW in here, but I think all of these um, public news entities um, are really important. And there's, and this is, I don't know just about communicating effectively, but I just have to get on a shtick about this for a minute, is that there's also offices at the, at the state um, legislature that are nonpartisan offices that are really trying to like, that are writing laws and and doing, trying to do analysis that is about what is actually happening. Um, and, and partisanship has its place also. And, and um, But I think just having entities that are working on understanding things to understand them is really important to, to our citizenry. Um, and and just communicating effectively, again, I think is, is everything. Like if we can't hear each other and sit down and listen, um, we can't move forward together. And I think the um, there's a lot of work to be done in how we're communicating what we need, but also how are we receiving what's out there? Like, and how are we really hearing and sitting with um, why a legislator maybe has a particular opinion about a thing or a stakeholder group doesn't want to engage on that thing? Like, can we, what are they really needing? And, under, and, and I, feel, I think we have more common ground um, than we think sometimes, and especially kind of in the in the ways that we communicate now, and the sound bites and all of those things. I've I've also found I I went from working for the city of Seattle to a statewide organization, and the shift in what is expected and how we talk and and communications and just like the the variety of people I needed to communicate to actually really increased when I went to the state level, which makes sense in a way. But the city of Seattle also has a a, a very strong and like and good approach to equity communications um but but then can also be kind of um, um antagonistic to uh, uh more rural um considerations and that sort of thing and so i've been surprised in the rooms that i've been in and the way that we still have equity values that are communicated in different ways and um and that there's some real fears to understand and again there's no room for hatred in those sorts of things but um to communicate effectively, we have to understand better where we're all coming from. And that's hard work. <laughs> it takes time. Yes. Um, and I'll just say from like a political and advocacy space, um, I think part of the reason we're not connecting as well as we can is we just do everything the way we always have. How many people here have gotten a political mailer with a picture of the politician on it that just says, vote for me and list one or two issues, right? and then it has their website. Maybe it'll tell you to put your, your ballot in the drop box by a certain day, but that's what you get in the mail, right? We know that the number one thing you can communicate to people to get them to vote is not who your candidate is, but that their neighbor votes. And when you tell people your neighbor living at this address votes in every election or your neighbor name, it seems creepy, totally works. A little creepy, <laughs> totally works. Why are we still sending mail to people that just has the picture of the candidate? Nobody cares. Or you could do some storytelling, have a picture of someone that has a story to tell about why they're voting for this person. So I think part of what we need to do to connect is, is actually use what we know 
and stop doing the same thing we were doing in the 80s. I was very small at that time, just, you know. Um, <laughs> the other thing is we need to communicate through the whole political and advocacy cycle. Um, and what I mean by that is um, a lot of us hear about politics when it's time to fill out a ballot. We don't hear so much about what happens in the legislature. We don't hear so much about how the things that impact our day to day are um, attended to by our legislators. Um, so it, it's hard because it takes money to do these communications, but the more we can make the connection between your daily life, the policy, the people you vote for, I think the more we get people to actually do stuff. Um, and, and the last little thing I'll say is it, it takes so many layers. It takes social, it takes mail, it takes phone calls, it takes texting. Um, you know, it takes knowing that texts are more likely to be read if they have an emoji in them. So put an emoji in your text, right? But we know these things, we just don't do them. Um, so I think you're here, you're getting a great education about comms and PR. Um, push back when people say, oh, we've always done it this way. Um, because it's not the same community we've always been in. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question because we live in a time, right, where there are so many platforms for people to consume messages. Um, and it's really interesting because I, I, I'm, you know, applying it obviously to the grocery store and, mm -hmm. and to our associates. And we've got people in our stores that are 16 years old and we've got people that are 90 years old, right? So they're going to consume, you know, communication much differently. Um, and so it, it's really an interesting time that I think you need to spend a lot of time thinking about as you as you head out into the working world or wherever you are in life, because uh, boy, it's changing rapidly. And so, I you know, for us trying to communicate out policy changes uh, to our associates, you know, we we have associates that uh, have a flip phone, <laughs> believe it or not, mm -hmm. and then we've got sixteen year olds that you know do everything on their phone, and that's so so a lot of our communications now go out through it's called this it's called Fresh Start, and it goes through phones, and so when they're on the job, they log in to this you know Fresh Start, and they get their their messages through that. I think it's a really interesting time that we're living in right now. The fact that we've got companies that are still mail, you know, mailing out ads or mailing out flyers or which some people, I, you know, I guess it's effective for some, me, those go right into the garbage, right? And it seems like such a waste of, of trees <laughs> and ink and, and money. Um, so it really, it, I think that's a really thoughtful question that deserves a lot of contemplation because things are changing rapidly and so uh, the way we communicate messaging is, is, is so important because um, we've got generations walking the earth right now that have completely different um, habits of how they get their messages. And so it's something to always be thinking about. I would love to open it up for questions, but I want to ask one last question of you because I think this is really important for all you Murrow students out there. So do you all have any advice for our students who are interested in working in politics, policy, law, the news, PR? What's your advice? I'll go first this time. <laughs> that way no one can steal it. No. Um, what I always tell my kids, like every day when they'd go off to school, they're my daughter's graduating from grad school and my son's in college right now. But what I always said to them was, have fun, learn lots. And I think you should apply that as you head out in the working world, right? You need to still have fun. Yes, I know it's a job and it's work and you're trying to make a living and, and earn money so you can support yourself. But have fun with it. Bring joy to the work. And then don't stop learning. Learn lots. Find ways to, to learn from your coworkers, from your supervisors, from, from your customers, whoever it may be. Um, you want to be a lifelong learner because uh, that's how we're going to continue to just thrive as a, as a society. That's so joyful. I love that. <laughs> I, ha I have a more boring answer, which is if you want to get into um, sort of advocacy um, and activism as a profession, which you can do no matter what the Campus Job Center says, um, the best way in is volunteering. Um, volunteer on a campaign, knock some doors for a political candidate. You meet that candidate, they're gonna need staff on the next cycle, you'll get the call. Um, the other thing I'll just say real quick is as you're volunteering, don't be shy about saying, I want a job here. Um, people don't know that unless you say it. Um, and being a self-advocate is something that like culturally, I was not raised to do. Um, I'm very bad at it actually, but um, the more you can just say what you need and what you're looking for, the more you're gonna get it. 
yeah, both really good points. I think I'll echo um, what Laura was talking about earlier, like curiosity in your career path is follow your curiosity. Um, what things are interesting to you? Um, you know, if I think, I mean, I still, I didn't know what this job was all the way when I applied to it. So um, don't, ex it's okay to take a job and not know that you're going to love it and not know um, even what it is all the way, but uh, be in that job and look, look up from your desk, like look at what's around you and what's, and um, what is sounding interesting maybe over here if what, you, what, what is right in front of you is not that thing. Um, because that's at, you know, I found out about WSU having an office in Seattle because I had asked, I, I, we had an engineering event in Seattle. They said, oh, I'm going to be there already. I knew my department couldn't pay for me to go like there, but I'm like, I'm going to be there already. Can I go to this event? Can I cover this event? Can I do some social media for us? Um, and that met, uh, allowed me to meet somebody at that office who then had seen some infographics that I had made. I'm not a graphic designer, but you know, I saw what the department needed a little bit. And I was like, I can stretch into some of these places. Um, and then, you know, that all snowballed in ways that I, that I didn't know, um, were possible, but talk to build, talk to people, build relationships. And it's okay if you don't know what you want to like, um, start taking a step in a direction and then pay attention to what you like and don't like. And, um, and you'll get there. I would say specifically anything with government or policy or communication, um, being informed and engaged is like the best way to start because there's an endless number of things that you can learn about these things, but it helps a lot if you're not starting from nothing. And you, you can't explain something well if you don't understand it well yourself and you won't be able to explain it in a way most people will understand. Um, but something that goes with that is that don't be afraid to ask dumb questions. When I first started, I was like so worried about looking like an idiot that I would pretend like I understood things. And then I'd go to write something and I'd be like, I don't actually understand this at all. So even if it seems like a really dumb question, like just ask it. Cause it's better that you understand it and that you tell it correctly than that it's okay to look dumb. So. <laughs> Perfect. I think we'll open it up for questions. We have a few minutes before lunch. Any questions in the audience? So I do street interviews. And recently, I went around and asked students who they were voting for in the primary election. And I got an overwhelming response from students saying, I don't care or I'm not voting. So how do we make people in our generation care about politics, policy, law, all of that stuff? I'll just jump in here. Yeah, I think I'm the it. most political person in the people, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, you gotta relate it to the day to day. And there is nothing more important to people than bread and butter issues of, can I put food on the table? Can I afford housing? Um, and for students, um, student debt forgiveness is huge, right? And it's been hard to follow. That, you know, Biden passed it, and then the courts rolled it back, and then they did it differently, and blah, blah, blah. The more simply we can say, this candidate wants to relieve student debt. How much debt do you have right now? How is that gonna impact your first career? How is that gonna delay you buying a house? Is that gonna delay you um, getting in a long-term relationship or having a family? Um, and having a conversation that is issue-based, not candidate-based, and asks more questions than it gives answers, um, gets people really con making those connections. Sorry. I'd, I'd also back. add, no, I, I, I think that's great. I, that's a great, um, great answer. And I think also um, encouraging people to look more at local politics, like the federal stuff is um, a mess and we need to engage in it still. And we need to, and you know, if you're, and there's ways to engage in like making federal government better too. That's, it's a whole thing, but there's so much that happens at the city level, at the county level, at the state level, that really matters to your day to day as well. And there are people working on the ground there collaboratively. Um, watch TVW interviews. So I just like was I just was watching the end of session and was really touched by the number of Republicans that were saying uh, really meaningful things about how they worked with Democratic um, members of office that were retiring and vice versa. And that's the stuff we don't hear. You don't. It's not. That's not a headline. But really, I'm like, oh, these people actually work together. And not all of them. There is a lot of crazy that's happening. But there are people doing good work. And there are ways you can influence that change. And legislators really 
they do talk to you. They do listen to people. So, yeah. I will just jump in. I like I I feel that I have empathy for what <laughs> you're hearing because you look at what's going on out there in the political scheme, right? And it it kind of shoulder slumped and <laughs> you just feel like, well, what's the purpose? Like, it's just a mess. But I, I tend to be a glass half full. I tend to be a little annoying because I'm a little <laughs> joyful at the wrong times. But I, I do think that as you get older and as you mature and you start paying taxes and you start you know, interacting with society more because you're, you're on your own, right? You're, you're responsible for yourself. I do think it forces you to become more engaged. And so I'm gonna choose to hope that all those students you talk to as they, as they venture out into the working world and um, start to see how policy does impact them. My hope is that they will have a much different answer, but again, I can be a little too optimistic at times, so. Um, so obviously we're in a little bit of an increasingly um, polarized political space right now. How do you think as like communications personnel that we work around that or even like play into it or how um, we use, like how do we reach citizens in this kind of space that we're in right now? I, I try to be a unifier with my, with my job and with uh, the things that I write and the things that I produce and the stories that I tell. I don't want to be divisive. And I don't think anyone goes out purposely trying to divide people, but that is a lens that I'm always applying to the things that I write and I, I produce is how can I unify groups um, instead of trying to pit people against each other or trying to point out things that are going to be. Um, so I think it's, it's really knowing your audience and, and trying to make sure that you are accurate and you're providing true accurate information to people, but doing it in a way that hopefully is unifying and, and uplifting. Um, I'll go back to Toolbox for just a minute. And there's something I encourage everyone to look into. If you haven't seen, it's called the Race Class Gender Narrative. Um, it is research-based structure for messaging. Um, and it's for messaging issues uh, in a way that builds, a, you know, a tent of two thirds, not that other third. We don't talk about that. Um, and, and the idea is that you start your communication with the shared value. I talked about that earlier. Then you move on to who is violating that value. And if you can say it, why? Uh, you remind people that they have power to create change. And then you say what you're going to do that will create that change. Four parts, four sentences, one paragraph, main message, done. Um, but when we talk from a values perspective, we have so much in common. I actually read there was a poll the other day that said that American values are very shared with like one exception. Um, so when you talk about freedom, we all love freedom. You know, frame your issue in, in freedom, frame your issue in community, frame your issue in, um, you know, the success of our children um, and the future of our state. Um, and you can make that bridge so that you can start having the conversation. I'll just say quickly from like a journalism perspective, I know that earlier I talked about general distrust in the media, but a lot of that is at national media. And most people, when you actually talk to them, they they trust their local news sources and getting involved at the local level. You know, people know who you are, they see you, they know you're a real person, you're not a bot or something or AI. <laughs> um, I think getting messaging through that venue is probably the best way to reach people in your community because they know that you're a real person and they're, they're more willing to trust you than they are something um, that they see on like CNN or something like that. Well, I think we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> See, I agree. <laughs> if you want to stay after, if you didn't get to ask a question, I'm sure our panelists would chat with you for a second, but I know you're probably all hungry too. So thank you for joining us today and have a great time at the rest of the symposium. <laughs>